It's good to see everyone. Welcome to Redeeming Grace Fellowship. Um, if I didn't get to meet you, I'm Pastor Dana. I'm really glad you're here this morning to be with us. We've made it to week 20 in our series on the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, even though we refer to it as a book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians is really a 2,000-year-old letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that he planted in the city of Corinth. A couple of weeks ago, we began a new section of his letter that deals with divisions that were happening in the church in their corporate worship gatherings. This week, we're going to begin looking at the third division that the Apostle Paul had to deal with, namely the misuse or overemphasis of particular spiritual gifts in the life of the church. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to go ahead and open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, there should have been a black hardback Bible on or around the seat that you're sitting in. If you don't have one, you can grab one of those and flip to 1 Corinthians 12. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, just take the one that was on your seat. You can have it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to make our way through the whole chapter. I promise we won't be, be here any longer than we normally are. It's going to be a quick overview of chapter 12, and the majority of our time will be spent in verses 7 through 11. Before we jump into that, I'm going to pray, ask God to help us this morning, be with us, to teach us his word, and help us to apply it to our lives. So let's pray together. Father, it is good to be with your people this morning, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces through to our hearts, revealing our motives and laying us bare before you. There is nowhere that we can hide from you, God, so we, we come before you in praise. We come before you to worship you for what you've done for us in the person and work of Jesus. And we come ultimately to know you better, to love you more, to sit under the authority of your word that we might become more like Jesus. We know that the purpose that you have for your people is to become conformed to the image of Jesus and that one day we will be completely conformed to his image when he returns in power and glory. But until then, that process is slower than we would like as we still struggle with sin in our lives. So as we come before you, we pray that you would help us by the power of your spirit to walk in accordance with your word, to walk in obedience to you, to walk in holiness. And we thank you that that's been made possible because of what Jesus has done for us at the cross and through his resurrection. We thank you for your forgiveness, your love, your grace, and the empowerment that you give us to live for you. So as we walk through 1 Corinthians 12, Father, I pray that your spirit would come and teach us the things revealed about him in this chapter and about the gifts that he gives. Father, may you be glorified in the time that we spend in your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The church of Jesus Christ has received and experienced the promise that Josh read for us earlier from Joel chapter 2. God promised his people that one day he would pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. That is, he would pour out his Spirit upon not only Jews, but on people from every tribe and language and people and nation as they come to faith in Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the Deliverer, the Great King, and become incorporated into his body, the church. The reason that we know the church has received and experienced the promise described in Joel 2 is because the Apostle Peter taught exactly that when he preached on the day of Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven. In Acts 2, we read about how the Holy Spirit came upon the church in power, just like Jesus had promised. Acts 2, 4 says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The result of that experience was that Jews who had gathered into Jerusalem from all over the known world in order to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost heard about the mighty works that God had done through Jesus Christ in their own native 
languages. Many in the crowd were stunned, amazed that they were hearing the gospel being declared in their own languages. But others in the crowd just simply dismissed the disciples as being drunk because they couldn't comprehend what was happening. They couldn't understand how could these disciples, these Galilean fishermen, how can they be speaking languages that they have never learned before? They dismiss them as having too much wine too early, the Bible says. But then in Acts 2.14, it says that Peter stood up and lifted up his voice and addressed them. He began to preach the word of God to them. He began to preach to the people that had gathered there, explaining that what they were witnessing was the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. And he quoted the same passage that we read together earlier to show them that. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came in power and the church of Jesus Christ was born. After Peter preached, about 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus and were baptized into the church. And ever since that time, the Holy Spirit has continued to come in power upon God's people. The Spirit comes and brings about the new birth and unites us to Jesus through faith in the gospel. The Spirit fills us and empowers us to live on mission in this world for the glory of God. The Spirit indwells us and seals us unto the day of redemption, that we might persevere in the faith to the end. And as we will see in 1 Corinthians 12, the Spirit manifests himself in the life of the church through spiritual gifts that he gives to us as followers of Jesus Christ. So we'll begin our journey through 1 Corinthians 12 by looking at verses 1 through 3 to see the fundamental way to discern whether or not the Holy Spirit is at work around you. So 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 3. Look at that with me. It'll be up on the screen if you're not there yet. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Paul begins by stating the importance of this issue. He says he does not want them to be uninformed or ignorant about spiritual gifts and the work of the Holy Spirit. And after acknowledging how far from God they were prior to coming to faith in Jesus, Paul begins to unpack the most basic of tests when it comes to discerning the work of the Holy Spirit. No one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. People who are genuinely born of the Spirit of God do not curse Jesus. That seems to be obvious. Likewise, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. That is to say, no one can genuinely receive Jesus Christ by faith and submit to his lordship except by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the most basic test of discernment that you and I can perform to see whether or not an event or a ministry, or a worship gathering, or what someone is saying, whether they're using a spiritual gift or not, the most basic test of discernment that you can perform to see whether or not any of those activities or works are the genuine result of the Holy Spirit's work. It will depend on whether the work of Jesus is exalted and treasured or scorned and belittled. And that test kind of clues us in to what the ministry role of the Holy Spirit ultimately is, namely glorifying Jesus. That is the primary role of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus taught his disciples during his earthly ministry about the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit was going to come upon them in power, he said that his being glorified by the Holy Spirit was one of the main distinguishing marks of the Spirit's activity. In John 16, Jesus taught them saying this, 
When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit's role is one in which he illuminates the scriptures, the Bible, to us. And glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ in his work so that we can see, understand, and receive the gospel. Genuine Holy Spirit wrought worship, ministry, speaking of any kind, whether it's preaching, teaching, or any of the kind of speaking gifts that we're going to look at shortly. Genuine Holy Spirit wrought worship, including all the ways we use our spiritual gifts, should result in the lordship of Jesus being honored and lifted up. Now, in verses 4 through 6, Paul begins to talk about the diversity that exists within the church when it comes to spiritual gifts. And he grounds that diversity and unity in the very persons of the Godhead, the very persons of the Trinity. Look at verses 4 through 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Paul's point is clear. Though not all spiritual gifts are the same, they are all given by the same Spirit, namely the Holy Spirit. Though there are many ways to serve God and His people, there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. And though there are many different ways in which God works in the world through the activities of his people, there is only one God behind all of it, and the glory of all of that work ultimately redounds to the glory of God the Father. So there's diversity among the gifts of the Spirit, among the ways in which we can serve Jesus, and among the activity that God brings about, but it is all ultimately the work of the one true and living triune God of the Bible. Now, it is from there that Paul launches into a more detailed explanation of the diversity that exists among the gifts of the Spirit. And this is where we'll spend most of our time this morning. Look at verses 7 through 11 with me. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. And to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Paul begins and ends this section of the chapter with two of the most important truths found in it. Namely, that each born-again believer in Jesus is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, and that all spiritual gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 7 and verse 11. In other words, the Holy Spirit is sovereign in bestowing spiritual gifts to believers, and those gifts are given for the good of God's people. The primary way that God works in, through, and among his people is through his people. And as you walk through verses 8 through 10, you see some of the ways that the Holy Spirit sovereignly works for the good of the church. As he gives the gifts that we need in order to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus, and know, love, and serve one another as God's people. 
So let's walk through this. Some believers are given the spiritual gifts of utterance of wisdom or utterance of knowledge. Maybe you have a different translation that translates it word of wisdom, word of knowledge, message of wisdom, message of knowledge. There may be a time when you need to hear a word of wisdom from God to help you through a time of either sin or struggle, discouragement, a time when you need to make a very important decision, a a time when you just need to talk to another believer. And while we can certainly just open up God's word and know for sure every time without fail when I crack this book open, I hear the voice of God. Yes, that's true. But there are many times in which God is pleased to use a fellow brother or sister in Christ to come alongside of us to speak a timely word of wisdom or a word of knowledge to us that brings about repentance or encouragement or the strengthening of our faith or whatever it is that we need in that time. God is pleased to give some of his people to bring that about. Some believers are given the spiritual gift of faith in which they are empowered by the Holy Spirit with a special measure of faith in order to trust God deeply to accomplish something or to see them through a particular situation. Now, as we make our way through these verses, I am keenly aware that there is a lot of debate and discussion in the church about which of these gifts are still operating in the church today, um, there's a lot of debate. That's all I can really say about it. People fight with each other over it. Churches split over it. Denominations happen over it. I don't have time this morning to make any particular arguments for either side of the debate, but I will just lay my cards on the table and tell you that I don't believe any of the demonstrably miraculous spiritual gifts described in verses 8 through 10 have completely ceased operating in the church. However, that is not to say that I've experienced them all or that there are not counterfeit demonstrations taking place in the church today or that they manifest themselves with the same frequency or intensity that they did in the early church, like when we read through Acts. I'm not saying any of that. One of the reasons I don't believe that any of the gifts described in verses 8 through 10 have ceased is found at the very end of the chapter, and we'll see that when we get there. The other reason is found in chapter 13, so if you want to hear that reason, come back next week, and we'll look at that, or you can just turn there and read it. But anyway, we'll deal with that some next week. Paul goes on to write that some believers are given gifts of healing. And in the Greek manuscripts that our English translations are based on, both of those words that are making up the phrase gifts of healing are plural. Gifts of healings is what it says. So it's for that reason, gifts of healings, and when you study that out and what the implications of that may be, it's for that reason I'm very, very skeptical of professing Christians, particularly ones that you find on television. I don't meet a lot in person in Fayette County, but they're here, that tout themselves to be faith healers. Like they have the gift of healing all the time without fail. This gift probably doesn't operate that way. And while there were certainly apostles who seemed to bring about supernatural healing frequently throughout the New Testament, I'm inclined to think that it's not the case that one particular believer gets this gift and then is referred to, I'm a healer, that's my spiritual gift. But rather that at various times and probably with some tie-in to the previously mentioned spiritual gift, faith, people are granted this spiritual gift to bring about healing for situations like we see in Acts 14.9, what we see in James 5.15. In the New Testament, the laying on of hands and the anointing with oil are commonly used methods when healing occurs. And because faith, the spiritual gift of faith, is always mentioned as well, that leads me to think that there is some kind of link between the spiritual gift of faith and gifts of healing. It's probably not a temporary or a permanent 
gift, but something that God sovereignly dis- bestows upon his people by the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, Paul begins to work through some of the even more controversial gifts found in this list. He begins by teaching that some believers are given the spiritual gift referred to as the working of miracles. The Greek word translated as miracles is the plural form of the word dynamis, which means power. It's the same word that our English word dynamite is derived from. Dynamis, dynamite, power. That word is used in Acts 1.8 when Jesus tells the disciples that as they wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit to come, when he does, they will be clothed in power. Same word. When you read through the book of Acts, you quickly see what is meant by the spiritual gift of miracles. It doesn't take you very many pages flipping through Acts to see what Paul is talking about. It includes the working of divine power in situations such as deliverance from danger, an intervention to meet special needs in the physical world, in judgment on those who irrationally or violently oppose the gospel, in vanquishing demonic forces, and in any other way in which God's power is manifestly evident to further God's purposes in a situation. Every page you turn in Acts, you're seeing that. Some believers are given the spiritual gift of prophecy. We won't go into much detail regarding the nature of that gift because Paul devotes the entire section of chapter 14 to discussing that. So we will spend a week looking at that. Suffice it to say that when you study the New Testament spiritual gift of prophecy, and the Apostle Paul's treatment of it in 1 Corinthians 14, it doesn't seem to be the case that Old Testament predictive prophecy, like that you see in Daniel or Isaiah, when they're predicting with 100% accuracy the future and unforeseen events, it doesn't seem that New Testament prophecy is the same as Old Testament predictive prophecy. One of the foremost authors on the gift of prophecy that I've been tremendously helped by, Dr. Wayne Grudem, defines the spiritual gift of prophecy as telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. But as I've already said, we'll look at that in very much uh, detail in chapter 14. In verse 10, Paul teaches that some believers are given the spiritual gift referred to as the ability to distinguish between spirits. This gift is the ability to distinguish between the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of demonic forces. Just making a statement like that probably causes some of you to be uncomfortable talking about demons or the demonic Because it forces us to deal with the reality that we do not merely live in a physical realm, but also in a spiritual one. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul teaches that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, physical, but with principalities, powers, and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, spiritual And while we are all called to use discernment as followers of Jesus, verse 10 reveals that there is a special endowment of discernment given to those Christians who have been granted this spiritual gift. Finally, Paul ends this section by teaching that some believers are given the spiritual gifts of various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. The term tongues simply means languages. This is probably the most controversial gift that is found in this list. As I have wrestled through attempts to understand this gift over the years, the person that I have found to be most helpful in understanding it is, again, Dr. Wayne Grudem. He defines the gift of tongues this way. Speaking in tongues is prayer or praise spoken in syllables not understood 
by the speaker. And again, this is controversial. People fist fight over this gift. There are churches that teach you're not even a true Christian unless you've experienced this gift. And there are some who say no one experiences this gift ever anymore. And everywhere in between. Some people, I'm open but cautious. That used to be what I like to call myself. I'm open but cautious. Mainly that means I don't really believe in it. But in the Bible, it seems like it's there. So that's what open but cautious means. Even though I didn't act like that's what it meant. One of the reasons surrounding its controversy is that this gift is often exercised during the corporate worship gatherings of local churches, even though the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in chapter 14 to discourage the use of this gift in corporate worship gatherings unless there is someone with the gift of interpretation present who can interpret so that everyone can benefit from what is being said. And as I said, there's many different views on that gift. We can't dig into that this morning. We'll look at it again in chapter 14. In the meantime, please be sure to nail your community group leaders with questions on the spiritual gifts this week. They will very much appreciate that, especially tongues. So be sure to bring that up. Uh, you'll probably find a variety of opinions, even among the people in community groups. The most important thing, regardless of where you land on it, is that you go and test your thoughts and opinions on this issue and every issue with the scriptures. Go to the scriptures. Now, in verses 12 through 26, Paul is going to transition from discussing how the one spirit and many sp spiritual gifts exist and how there is one body of Christ and many members that belong to it. Look at verses 12 through 26 with me as we read that together. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This section of chapter 12 really doesn't require too much elaboration. Paul is very clear. All the parts of the body of Christ are important. All of them. All the members of the body need to be operating in order for the body to function the way it was designed to function. All the people that make up the body of Christ, particularly the local church is what we're thinking here, are needed for the sake of mission and corporate worship. 
not just the members of the parts of the body with spiritual gifts that get them in front of the congregation. As Paul explains in verses 24 through 26, God has built up the body of Christ, the church, and has called the members of that body to care for one another, to suffer together, and to rejoice together, to live life together in unity. We are to use our spiritual gifts for the common good of the body in order to build one another up, using our gifts in such a way as to foster a spirit of unity in the church, unlike the way some of the Corinthian believers were fostering division by emphasizing certain spiritual gifts over others. We're going to close this morning by reading verses 27 through the first part of verse 31. Look at that section with me. Verses 27 through the first half of verse 31. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. Paul closes this section by once again recapping some of the spiritual gifts, this time including some of the offices of the church as well. But then he goes on to ask several rhetorical questions. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? When you read those questions, they are asked in such a way, they are designed in such a way that the answer that you are to supply is no. Not all Christians have all these gifts. That is why we need each other as the body of Christ so badly. That's the point of the whole entire chapter. We need each other. We need all of our members to be functioning as one body. We need all of our gifts to be working in unison with one another. The Holy Spirit's role in the history of the salvation of God's people is ultimately to glorify Jesus Christ. If Jesus is not being glorified, the Holy Spirit is not at work. He applies the saving work of Jesus to God's chosen people through faith in the gospel. And he empowers those same people to glorify Jesus as they live on mission for him and build up the church by serving her and others with the spiritual gifts that they have received. And even though there are many different kinds of spiritual gifts and many different members with different roles, there is ultimately one spirit that is working in us and one body of Christ into which we have been baptized as believers. No, we don't each have all of the spiritual gifts, but we at least have one and we're called to use it. 1 Corinthians 12, 8, to each, that is to each believer in Jesus, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good, for the good of God's people. But after Paul asks the questions that are designed to teach us that we don't all have all the gifts and that we need each other because of that, he exhorts the Corinthian believers and I believe us to earnestly desire the higher gifts. That's one of the reasons that I don't believe it's wise to teach that certain gifts have completely ceased or to warn people not to seek certain gifts or to be so cautious and so unafraid or so afraid rather of spiritual gifts that you function 
as though your experiential understanding of the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Bible, rather than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. No, that's not original. I ripped that off of somebody. I don't remember who it was. But when I heard it, I was like, I have been living like that. Like the third member of the Trinity is my Bible and not the Holy Spirit. It's like, ooh, Holy Spirit, stay away. Like we're scared of him, but we shouldn't be. We cannot be afraid of the Holy Spirit and the power that he longs to give to his people. Often we are afraid to truly experience him and avail ourselves to the power that is at work in us. The same power, scripture says, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is inside of you if you are in Christ. When I read over that, I should be floored, but I'm often like, the same power that is in me is in, that raised Jesus from the dead. And I just move on like, Think about that. Jesus Christ was dead for three days and the same power that raised his body to life and glorified his body in perfection is the same power that is at work in all who know Jesus. That is awesome. And that is something that I don't want to be afraid of or to shy away from. I just don't think it is wise or helpful to command believers in Jesus to do the exact opposite of what the Apostle Paul commands them to do. And the Apostle Paul commands us to earnestly desire the higher gifts. Desire them. It's okay. Just don't make an idol out of them or misuse them if you have them. I was in a prayer meeting once and one of the brothers that I love so dearly and respect was talking and he was saying we shouldn't desire other spiritual gifts we should just be thankful for the ones that we have and I said what about when Paul says earnestly desire the higher gifts what do you do with that is that just irrelevant he was like hmm, I don't know I was like Paul commands us to earnestly desire the higher gifts it's not like optional like you can if you want earnestly desire the higher gifts of the Spirit. So let's do that. Let's earnestly desire to be used and gifted by the Holy Spirit in such a way as to build up the body of Christ and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's desire that. Or it might be even better to ask this. Are you using the spiritual gift that you already have to serve the body of Jesus? Maybe before desiring more, use the one you have or find out what it is if you're not sure. Serve in the church. I encourage you to work through these kind of things in community groups this week. To ask questions, to dig into the scriptures, to test yourself to see what your gift might be. We've talked a lot this morning about some of the benefits that we receive as followers of Jesus. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive spiritual gifts. We receive the sweet fellowship of the body of Christ. But all of those things are completely irrelevant if you have not received the greatest gift of all. That gift is a person and his name is Jesus. So if you are here this morning and you have not received Christ, if you have not been saved from God's wrath and your guilt by trusting in the person and work of Jesus, these gifts are meaningless to you because you need something far more than a spiritual gift. You need to be saved from your sin. You need to be rescued. And the only person that can do that for you is Jesus Christ. Jesus died as our substitute on the cross, was buried and was raised on the third day by the power of God, such that all who repent of sin and trust him will be saved. They will be saved. Josh read it for us in Joel 2. 
There's coming a day when all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That day is now. And if you are here and you have not received Christ, repent and believe. Trust him. Receive him. We are going to go to a time of celebration, a time of singing God's praises. Before we do, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your grace, for Jesus Christ and what he has done to rescue us and redeem us from sin and to reconcile us to you forever. We come together to praise you for that, to worship you for that, and I pray that if there are those here gathered today who have not received Jesus, that you would work in their hearts to make them alive in Christ, that you would open their eyes to see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Father, I pray that you would work in all of our hearts and conform us to the image of your Son as we praise you for who you are and what you have done. We love you so much. We are grateful for you. We are grateful for your spirit and we are thank you, thankful for the gifts that you have given us. Lord, may we use them for the glory of Jesus and the building up of the body of Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children are a gift from God. In Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, we read this. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. As believers in Christ, we are called to recognize that children belong first and foremost to God. God in his goodness gives children as gifts to parents. Parents not only have the awesome responsibility of caring for this gift, but also the wonderful privilege of enjoying the gift. Because children belong to God and are given by grace as gifts to parents, it is only proper and appropriate that children be dedicated back to God. Believers who trusted in the promises of God under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they dedicated their children to the Lord. We are told in 1 Samuel 1 that Hannah presented her son Samuel to the Lord. In Luke 2.22, we read that Mary and Joseph brought their baby, the Lord Jesus, to the temple in Jerusalem in order to present him before his father. And while we as new covenant believers in Jesus aren't commanded in the New Testament anywhere to formally dedicate our children in this way, it is a tradition that can serve as a means of great encouragement to not only the parents but also to the local church. This morning, Jonathan and Bethany Stang bring their daughter Ella and Jared and Abby Cooster bring their daughter Amelia, presenting first themselves and then their daughters before the Lord our God in the church of Jesus Christ. Jonathan and Bethany, Jared and Abby, I call your attention to the commands of God in Holy Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7 tell us, actually 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God's instructions are plain, and thanks to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the empowering grace of God, we can walk in obedience to these commands. Jonathan and Bethany, Jared and Abby, 
God has called you to love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and to teach Ella and Amelia to do the same. As you love God and one another, your model before your children of a wonderful love for God is something that he is pleased to use for the good of your children, for your good, and for the glory of his name. Jonathan and Bethany, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your, your desire to dedicate yourselves and your daughter Ella to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying we do. Jared and Abby, by coming forward before God and his people, the church of Jesus Christ, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your daughter Amelia to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying we do. Having come freely, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of Christ Jesus and his church so that Ella and Amelia may walk in the abundant life that Jesus offers. Do you, Jonathan and Bethany, Jared and Abby, resolve by God's grace and in partnership with the church to provide Ella and Amelia a Christ-centered home of love and grace, to raise them in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, to encourage them to one day trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and to live for the glory of his great name. If so, please respond by saying, we do. Finally, I ask that the church make a commitment as well. While these parents are the ones who are primarily responsible for the discipleship of their children. They are also members of the body of Christ who are seeking to raise their children in the context of this local church as covenant members of Redeeming Grace Fellowship. So I direct my questions now to the church. If you are here this morning as a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you belong to his body the church, the body that we read about this morning in 1 Corinthians 12. And while we encourage you to love and support Jonathan, Bethany, Jared, and Abby as their friends, family, and brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to now specifically address members of Redeeming Grace Fellowship. So if you're able and you're a covenant member of Redeeming Grace, would you please stand up? Don't be shy. If you are a covenant member of Redeeming Grace, please stand. Having come freely, I ask now that you make the following commitment to those before you. So that Ella and Amelia may walk in the abundant life that Jesus offers, do you resolve by God's grace to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help Jonathan, Bethany, Jared, and Abby be faithful to God to help teach and train their children in the ways of the Lord so that they might one day trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and live for the glory of his name. If you accept this responsibility, please respond by saying, we do. You, you can be seated. I'm going to close by giving you the benediction that Jude gives us at the end of his letter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together, guys. Father, I thank you so much for Jared and Abby, for Jonathan and Bethany, and for the gifts of these children that you have given them. And we pray that by your grace, you would work in such a way as to bring about Amelia and Ella Grace one day trusting and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I pray that you would give Jared and Abby, Jonathan and Bethany, wisdom. They may, that they might serve their children well. 
that they might love them, that they might show the glory of Jesus and the great love with which he has poured out upon us as the church, that that would shine brightly in their home. Pray you'd help them, Father. Help us as a church to come alongside of them, to help them, raise Amelia and Ella in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Help us to just be faithful to them, to continually serve them, and to love them well as you've called us to as your church. I pray that you, Lord Jesus, are glorified in the lives of those who have come today before you. We love you so much. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.